licensing and uh, regulatory regime for digital banks in India. Uh, the, this discussion is actually a discussion of a paper which the Niti Aayog has published almost three weeks ago uh, for uh, setting up uh, exclusive digital banks in the country. Now, let me just briefly, and we have here a very distinguished panel of four uh, experts, two from the academia and two from the banking uh, sector, one from the central banking sector and the other from the commercial banking. And uh, uh, what I would do right now is to just give you a brief account of the larger context in which this uh, conversation is taking place. This conversation on uh, introduction of uh, digital banks, which seems to be a brand new thing. Although uh, we have had existing incumbent commercial banks or offering us a range of uh, digital products. Okay. And of course, since uh, 2007 onwards, we also had uh, the payment and settlement systems in place with a whole host of digital payment systems uh, available to even for retail payments. And this has been somewhat growing in volume terms uh, recently, although in value terms, the growth rates have been slightly low. Okay. And uh, the concept of digital banks is uh, very much in, uh, interesting because if you start from 2007, as I said before about payment and settlement systems uh, with an act in that year, and then, of course, we have had various kinds of digital payment modes uh, taking place from that year onwards, and it received a kind of a, a artificial push, if I may use the term, uh, with the demonetization of 2016-17. But along with that, we also had a number of things which were happening in the banking sector. For instance, we had the PMJDY accounts, which were created in 2014, and according to the government, Apparently, right now, there are about 420 million such PMs, JDY accounts. Uh, uh, then, of course, you have the universal payment interface that was introduced in 2016. And if you take on some of the more recent uh, uh, months, almost like 4 trillion rupees uh, worth of uh, UPI payments have actually taken place. Okay. And then, of course, we have had also payment banks and small finance banks, which were also set up uh, during this period. And our existing commercial banks were also introducing, as I was saying before, a whole host of uh, digital products. And some of the banks have uh, digital banking functions in almost in its entirety, okay? You can, uh, you know, both deposit money as well as uh, get loans through digital means. By digital means, I mean internet and other proximate uh, channels through other prox proximate channels. So what the government wants to do right now is to have the prudential and uh, liquidity norms for these digital banks in par with incumbent commercial banks. And they want to do this in a, a calibrated way and uh, uh, and hence this uh, discussion paper. So I think it's very important to discuss this because it has got lots of implications, uh, implications for increasing productivity, access to more financial inclusion, especially for the MSME sector. And as you know, the last uh, census of the uh, MSME sector actually showed that there were about 64 million MSME units. And most of these have to rely on informal credit mechanisms, okay? And digital banks supposed to you know, include most of these with the spread of uh, uh, broadband internet. And broadband internet has now diffused so much, uh, according to the Telecom Regulatory Authority of India, we have something like 800 million subscribers, okay? So against this context, I think uh, uh, it is important to discuss this because it has also got large implications for uh, employment as well, because if you are going to have brick and mortar commercial banks going to be uh, replaced with digital banks, with very few people working there, you know, that can also have a kind of a deleterious effect on employment in the services sector, because banking and financial services account for the 
largest segment of the services sector of our economy. So we have a very distinguished panel here, and I will start with uh, Professor Partha Ray. Professor Partha Ray is actually the, currently the director of the National Institute of Bank Management at Pune. Before that, for about 10 years, he worked as a professor of economics at the Indian Institute of Management, Calcutta, where he taught macroeconomics, global political economy, and recent, recent issues in monetary policy and banking. And before joining the uh, Indian Institute of Management, Calcutta, in 2007, he worked for a, uh, a number of years uh, at the RBI. In fact, starting with uh, uh, 1989, if I'm not mistaken. And, uh, and then he rose to positions such as the advisor to the executive director of India at the International Monetary Fund. And also, uh, he was the director of the Department of Economic and Policy Research at the RBI. His PhD. Uh, Sharad sure, Nagraj. I see uh, my. Uh... Nagraj, uh, could you unmute yourself? Okay. Uh, uh, Professor Partha Ray has also uh, has done his education in Calcutta, of course, I suppose, Presidency College, uh, you know, and then Mumbai and at Oxford University, from where he has taken his DPhil or PhD. So, very warm welcome, uh, Professor Ray, to uh, the Center for Development Studies, of course, in a virtual way. After all, we are talking about digital banks, and uh, so everything is virtual these, uh, from that point of view. So, uh, so you have about uh, 15 minutes and thereabouts uh, to make your presentation. And after that, I will go to Mr. Narayan Ramchandran and then Mr. Ganesh Kumar, and then finally, Professor Suresh Babu. So, thank you very much, Professor Mani. Am I audible and visible both? Yes, you are audible okay. and visible, yes. Okay. Thank you very much for that rather generous introduction and correction. I had my MBA from Oxford and not my DP. Anyway, what you said exactly that I wanted to say that in some sense, discussing something on digital bank is like discussing an online seminar versus a physical seminar in some way. So in some way, I mean, the I'm, I'm not exactly, I do not share that hype and excitement, but nevertheless, let, let, let me tell you what exactly what I have in mind. So in this 15 minutes, I'll give a very brief summary to put the context and once in a while, I'll add my comments. So that's why I want to do. As Professor Mani has rightly said that Riti Ayog's paper sets a context. The other thing is UPI has really witnessed extraordinary adoption, recorded 4.2 billion transactions worth of 7.7 .7 trillion in just October 2021. The direct benefit transfers through apps already happening. We already have new payments bank. So India has some sense already have digital banking. So why then is a proposal, new proposal and new hype for digital banks? Is it that the, if the payment banks are narrow, digital banks are essentially a full service broad payments banks. The basic feature that the Niti Aayog paper does it, it emphasizes financial inclusion, it identifies significant credit gap, it gives an overview of the prevalent business models, it says the, what would be the regulatory, the regulatory vacuum and absence of a digital bank license regime, it constructs the digital global regulatory index and maps out certain identified benchmarks. And finally, it makes a case for the digital banks. Now, it gives certain country experiences China, UK, Singapore, Hong Kong, Malaysia has been the major one. One interesting thing when I was looking for the country experiences, what you get to see. And this has been, you know, very nicely put in a, in a study by McKinsey. It said, not every Asian digital bank is a success story. Of course, there are certain productive business models. More interestingly, in a recent study by Boston Consulting Group, it's, they found that 13 
out of 249 digital banks worldwide, about 5% of the total are profitable. And out of this 13, 10 are based in Asia Pacific. So what's special to Asia Pacific, that a model which normally doesn't, are not very successful elsewhere in the world, but in Asia Pacific, it becomes successful. One of the major things is, while digital banks in other geographies are often startups, Asian digital banking driven largely by established companies and consortia. Example, Alibaba supported MindBank, which is really the success story of digital banks. In fact, Chinese digital banks have been, have been shown almost like, like a poster child. South Korea's Kakao Bank, it was also successful, but there was, there was also big business behind that. And the recent flip to this excitement of digital banks came perhaps from COVID-19, where because of our inability to move, everything got impetus in terms of doing it digitally. And of course, on investment side, investors, particularly venture capital fund, have been more cautious and that, therefore that lent much momentum, some momentum to consolidation. Moving further, why digital banks? If you look at the construction of index, you get to see in some way four major motivations. First, entry barrier. Of course, digital banks have less entry barrier you would expect. Competition instances, you know, less costly, less costly way back in China, incurs a per cap account operation cost of just $5. It also lessens business restriction, that was it expects. And it says that technological neutrality is another area. How do they define? Now, when it comes to definition, they're sticking to the Banking Regulation Act, whereby, and I'm quoting from Banking Regulation Act, banking means accepting for the purpose of lending and investments of deposits of money for the public, repayable on demand or otherwise, and withdrawal by check, draft, order or otherwise. And banking company means essentially which transacts the business of banking. So these digital banks therefore will do all these things. The only difference is yes, they will primarily depend on the internet and other proximate channels. One can technically operate an account with a digital bank with just an internet connection and after fulfilling the KYC requirement. So to me, it is just any other bank account with a only digital presence or primary digital presence. When it comes to licensing, they are proposing a three-stage licensing. One, a restricted digital bank license. Second, they're saying regulatory sandbox, assuming there are students in this crowd, let me define regulatory sandbox is essentially an atmosphere of live testing of new products or services in a controlled or state regulatory environment. And then finally, when you fulfill step one and two, contingent on the satisfactory performance of the license, then if you become a full-fledged or full-stack digital bank, bank license. So that's these three stages. What are the requirements? Initially, 20 crore. When you move up full-fledged business, it might be 200, it would be 200 crores, so between 20 to 200. Now, the applicants of those DBs, for these DBs have to have an experience of an established track, track record in adjacent industries like commerce, payments, and technology. Like traditional banks, they will ha have the acceptance of the following all the infrastructure enablers like other KYC, NPCI, NEFT, RTGS, ATM, and others. The licensee of the digital bank will be ready to exit the sandbox and operate at a full-fledged digital bank. Depending on the progress, they will be subjected to prudential and liquidity bank regulation. There could be technological risk regulation and ex ante technological preparedness will entail various kinds of requirements. The business, as I said, everything there, 
that is that a standard bank does. Plus, of course, they can add this value-added services like payroll, account receivables, and tax compliance. In other words, they will have everything excepting a building product. To me, the legal me mechanics of the issue is, it says while RBI's authority to issue a license to the banking company under section two of the BR Act is straightforward, an additional step is necessary for creating a licensing regime for digital banks that permits them to offer value-added services. So it is within the current regulatory regime plus an additional step. So what are the challenges? Challenges could be, as we have seen already, in a number of countries, digital banks have been a failure, particularly those came from startups. There are limited revenue potential. There are potential obsolescence of you know, partner bank core banking system, and there could be high cost of capital and low entry barrier. So no entry barrier comes in both the sides of the picture. Why is this part of interest? And here I'm essentially speculating. First, in some sense, after the global financial crisis, banks in particular and finance in general have earned a bad name. And therefore they were hugely under the under the, under the glass of the regulators. There are a number of things, the restrictive norm for Basel norms, Dodd-Frank Act of the US and various things came up. Perhaps there was a vacuum and various digital companies came to fill up this vacuum. Completely in a, in a different field, we have seen the, the emergence of cryptocurrency, digital money, and is the digital banks perhaps can also be, be related to this particular vacuum, which was made by the so-called financial firms or the banks, and therefore the digital companies are there to fulfill that. Now I'll end my, my, my talk with uh, very brief some questions of which I do not know the answer. Will the capital requirement of a, of a digital bank necessarily be lower than the brick and mortar bank? Not necessarily. For whom the digital banks? The word digital at least will come from digitally literates. Yes, in India, the adult literacy rate is something like 70%, male 78, females could be 59, 60. I looked at this particular paper by, by Mathur and Mumtaz, which found out Given the definition of electronics and information technology, only 38% households in India are digitally literate. In urban areas, digital literacy relatively higher at 61% to just 25% in rural areas. Therefore, there are, there are stories. I can narrate one from, from what I've heard from an Eastern Indian, primarily Eastern Indian commercial bank where he described people from rural India who come to come to the ATM to withdraw money is someone will come with a piece of paper with the, with the password, pay five rupees to the watchman of the ATM and get it withdrawn. So therefore there are issues there. Is it a hype? I put it forward as a question. At the same time, Number of mobile phones in India are 1.5 billion. Number of mobile telephones per 100 population is something like 110. Bangladesh is 108. So it is hugely high. How many of them could be turned entirely in bank account? Are this, are this within this or without this? Which companies which enter the banking license? Again, I'm being speculative. Is it something like uh, a tussle between the global big tech, because often these days we say, quoting the Microsoft children, saying that we need banking, but do we need banks? So therefore, it, is it like from the global big tech versus Indian big tech, that kind of speculation? And finally, I'm a little intrigued with the role of Niti I mean, I would have expected this proposal, if at all, 
to come out as something like an RBI working group, which are from the banking sector. So I was slightly intrigued in this role, but I'm not aware of the background. I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Professor Patterson. I think you have raised very important points about uh, the feasibility of uh, digital banks in the country, where uh, digital literacy and also, uh, you know, uh, ownership of uh, bank accounts is still pretty low, despite what the PMJDY accounts would uh, suggest. Okay, and uh, so I think we will now go to the next speaker. Uh, he's uh, Mr. Narayan Ramchandran. He's already known to us because he has participated in two panel discussions before. Uh, towards the beginning of this year, he was uh, a member of the panel which discussed the entry of the corporate sector into banking. And subsequently, he also came back to discuss uh, the asset monetization pipeline of the Niti Aayog. Okay. Uh, Narayan Ramchandran has uh, done his B.Tech in Chemical Engineering from IIT Mumbai and then went on to do a MBA from the University of Michigan at Ann Arbor, returned and, to, uh, and he was working initially at Goldman Sachs and then uh, joined uh, Morgan Stanley and rose to very high positions within Morgan Stanley. Uh, and uh, at the last time that he was there, he was the country head of Morgan Stanley in India, leading all the group's businesses. He was also the head and lead portfolio manager of Morgan Stanley's global emerging markets and global asset allocation teams, managing over $25 billion uh, worth of assets. And uh, uh, here he has also a lot of experience because he was for eight years the chairman of a, one of the fastest growing private sector banks in the country known as RBL Bank. And uh, so he comes with a lot of experience of uh, a brick and mortar uh, commercial bank, which also has a digital uh, a large number of digital products. And these days he works, he calls himself as a social entrepreneur. And uh, he he's the chairman and co-founder of Include Labs and also a whole host of uh, other uh, organizations. He also writes a fortnightly column called the visible hand in the uh, business newspaper, The Mint. So Narayan, very warm welcome again to CDS. And let's hear what you have to say about digital banks. Uh, thank you, Professor Mani, and hello to all my fellow panelists. Uh, and thank you also for bringing up reference to the past two panels that I've been on, uh, Professor Mani, and you will recall on both of them, uh, I have been a skeptic. Uh, <laughs> And I remain a skeptic on this topic as well. Uh, so I hope you don't brand me a skeptic. It's just you're choosing the topic on which I'm skeptical about uh, rather than uh, follow a generally skeptical tone. Uh, the topic itself is hugely important uh, for a whole host of reasons, which I'll discuss in a second. Uh, but the paper is, in my view, extremely shallow and unimportant. So. So it triggers discussion about a super important topic, but uh, somewhat sophomoric in its uh, approach uh, is, is what I would say uh, to the Niti Aayog paper itself. Uh, uh, Professor Ray int uh, introduced the idea, why did this come from Niti Aayog? I think it's simply Niti Aayog currying favor with uh, high commands, uh, which is why this has come up. RBI is noticeably silent and most likely will remain noticeably silent for the foreseeable future. Um, before I delve into the paper itself, let me start with a meta point. The, 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 you know, why digital banks at all? Almost everybody thinks about digital banks as adding a little technology into banking. We have had technology in banking for the last 50 years, and the good banks have a cost efficiency ratio of now well in the 30s. So uh, technology in banking is not the reason to think about digital banks. Digital banks need to be thought about as you would think about, say, a digital retail player as what in te technology parlance would be called full stack or in what we would uh, call in English as sort of native digital 
uh, operations. And that's the reason to discuss digital banks as distinct from banks which have technology in them, since many, many banks uh, have technology in them. If you wish, it is like talking about why would, you know, uh, why would we have Amazon in an era in which we have all these other retailers who also have some technology associated uh, with them? The reason we do is because Amazon sort of reimagined it in a full stack kind of way. Of course, the point to note is Amazon is now acquiring physical presence in multiple jurisdictions, including, for instance, the whole purchase of Whole Foods in the U.S. So even digital, digitally native, digitally born ecosystems eventually need physical presence for large heterogeneous countries uh, such as the United States, China and India. So for banks and banking systems, it's important because banking system is a levered uh, system on a country. And because of the leverage, uh, you need to be rather careful and you need some sort of regulation to apply given the amount of leverage. A typical bank uh, is levered approximately 10 times, and therefore uh, you have to be careful about, uh, you know, how that is allowed to play. But that care is excessively practiced in India because we have taken the care to what I would call paternalism. And the paternalism from RBI essentially implies that we let out the, you know, kite with the rope uh, one meter at a time. The kite will not take off at all if you do that, as we know from Atams in Trivandrum, that uh, you cannot do that. You have to really give it a lot of rope in order for it to fly. So uh, we, have, we are at a sort of a conflict position here when if the RBI already knows how to run banks, then the purpose of newly innovative banking systems uh, will, be at, uh, uh, will be at the odds with that particular idea. So. We have a paternalistic uh, regulator combined potentially with some innovation, but if the two come together, then innovation doesn't have a chance to uh, chance to flourish. Let me talk about the paper itself. It isn't. Let me say it in three simple terms: the good, bad, and the ugly, as I did last time. The good part of it is it is an official paper, even though it comes from Niti Aayog. Niti Aayog, which has lost its relevance. Uh, uh, as as sort of the erstwhile pen planning commission had, uh, it you know it's there. It's a think tank, so it's allowed to think, uh, but it's still official, and so in that sense, it has a value, and and therefore it brings the discussion into the open. Uh, that I welcome extremely because I think it's a very important topic. So far, the idea of digital banks have been restricted to a few, uh, you know, op-ed columnists. And the conversation with RBI and any conversation with RBI goes like the follows. Hello, sir. I'm a, you know, a startup guy. I have lined up capital. I'd like to start a digital bank. RBI answers. Why don't you take the next 5 years? Go start an NBFC and come back to me when you have a little experience. So that's typically the way the conversation goes and has done for the last 3 or 4 years. I have actually been in 1 or 2 of them. So I'm speaking to you firsthand on, on this on this position. But the good news is with uh, with uh, Niti Aayog paper, at least hopefully we can have a little bit more discussion about it. The bad news is, 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 is sort of related to the good news, like an outside in paper. And because it's an outside in paper, we have no view, we have no knowledge of how RBI will react to this. RBI controls pretty much all the levers. As we know, RBI is a reluctant reformer and has not even worked on much more important, uh, what I would call antecedent conditions, like increasing deposit insurance, deepening of credit bureaus, and stopping from interfering in excessive annual financial inspection detail, so that they can do the bigger job of making the country prepared for greater inclusive. Uh, so from that point of view, I would say uh, it's an outside in paper does not anticipate the ground reality of getting it uh, both uh, accepted and improved upon uh, uh, by RBI. The ugly part of this paper is for an outside in paper, which should not be shackled by the typical shackles of an RBI. The imagination coefficient is extremely modest. It only imagines a digital bank as a distribution channel. 
and that is already there. I mean, you know, SBI has, you know, uh, while I worked at RBL, we had every manager of uh, every manner of banking as a service, including several APIs that we were feeding directly into existing startup ecosystems and so on. So, uh, you know, digital as a distribution channel is widely present. Now you could argue, how can you make it deeper? Bizarrely, it is actually rather quite present even in the microfinance segment, perhaps even more than the Bajaj finance segment, I would say. So India actually has quite a lot of, if you think of India as four countries, India has dramatic penetration in what I call the American Express country and in the microfinance country. It has only moderate penetration in the Bajaj finance country and in the sub-Saharan -Sub African country, so the second and the fourth country. So we are not looking at this in nuance and in detail. We are looking at it in some sort of a open, open sort of whitewash kind of method. And just simply applying technology to this is not going to help. You need to bring in approachability, uh, literacy, access, uh, behavioral modification, so on. Lots of changes required uh, for uh, the informality to become formality in the middle and uh, uh, last segment of the Indian market. The, the microfinance segment, thanks partly to a well-functioning set of credit bureaus, has improved dramatically, or even though it goes through shocks, such as the shock during demonetization and once again during the pandemic. Of course, the original shock was during the AP, AP crisis. The, you know, while the Indian payment system is, is worthy, in my view, of a Bharat Ratna, uh, we have not done much else beyond payments uh, as it relates to banks. This paper does not anticipate any new products, does not anticipate a new business model of any kind, does not even have a suggestion about a change in unit economics, has no comments on the most important thing in anything in digital, which is the customer acquisition cost. Here, I will slightly disagree with Professor Ray. The reason why, except for China, digital banks have been a failure almost everywhere else is that in China, customer acquisition came through other channels and you simply pumped the banking channel into the same customers. So these are what are called closed loop ecosystems that are run by uh, Tencent and Alibaba that were acquired for chatting and other social media purposes and have subsequently be converted into retail and banking products. China is in the midst of actually forcing a separation of these which is why Ant Financial, for instance, is going through the difficulty that it is going. But the most important and difficult question is the customer acquisition question for a digital bank. So if I start with a digital bank, given the, the small unit economics of each transaction, how do I acquire 5 million customers or 10 million customers? The government has made it uninteresting to do that only in payments, and therefore I do need to do it in credit. Lastly, in 10 years or so, I, I don't know the exact time in India, but in, in some time from now, many years from now, we will actually have artificial intelligence and machine learning be able to substitute completely for the heuristics of credit. But until then, digital banking remains simply a distribution channel and is not worthy of separate discussion. It needs to be discussed together with the banking system as it is, and therefore, I'm not entirely sure what the authors of this paper intend uh, intend to do. Now, it's possible that you could give a sort of a narrow, specific license to digital banking, but I think that would be that would be under under uh, optimizing a full stack. I would much rather that we wait and give a full digitally native bank an option to uh, to do all the products and services, and that might be some, some years, some years, some years away. So uh, I will wait till all the panelists complete to take additional questions on this. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Narayan, uh, for that very excellent presentation. And you have raised this important point about the customer acquisition costs, uh, which has not been thought through at all in the uh, discussion paper. I think that's a very important issue which uh, needs to be discussed as well. Uh, now we have Mr. Ganesh Kumar as the third panelist. Mr. Ganesh Kumar is a former executive director of the Reserve Bank of India. 
and his uh, responsibilities in the RBI included the entire gamut of payment and settlement systems. For instance, all these digital payments that we are talking about, he was uh, in charge of that for a fairly long period of time. I've had some very interesting conversations with him on the data and, and so on just this morning itself. Uh, uh, Mr. Kanesh Kumar, uh, while working in the RBI, has also been instrumental in the in num setting up a number of institutions which support digital payments. For instance, the IT Institute for the Banking Sector, facilitating in training and new service offerings, and uh, also the uh, the building up of the National Payments Corporation of India, uh, which is, uh, as you know, an important organization supporting digital payments in the country, and the Reserve Bank Information Technology Limited. Uh, uh, he was associated with that as well. He was also the uh, RBI's nominee on the Committee for Payment and Settlement Systems in the Bank for International Settlements in Basel, and also the co-chair of the FinTech Subcommittee of the Financial Stability Board of the BIS. So I think uh, we have a very good person in the form of uh, uh, Mr. Ganesh Kumar, and he has also been, in, you know, uh, I, if I'm going to read out all the things that he done in the RBI, I think uh, we will not be discussing the discussion paper on digital bank banks. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, some of the major digital payment systems that we take it for granted these days, for instance, the real term gross settlement um, and so on, the RTGS. Uh, he was very much instrumental in the introduction of uh, these various kinds of digital payment mechanisms. So I think it's ideally uh, suited to discuss, uh, and now he's no longer with the RBI, so he could be a little bit different, I suppose, in his uh, points of point of view. Uh, a very warm welcome, Mr. Ganesh Kumar, to CDS, and uh, we look forward to your presentation. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Professor Mani. Uh, 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 it's always uh, 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 a two way, like the Mridangam. Uh, you have one panelist uh, before you who has given one perspective, which uh, possibly uh, goes slightly different from what the discussion paper thinks about. Uh, thanks, Narayan, for that, Narayan Ramchandran, for that uh, uh, different perspective. And uh, my friend Pathare has given uh, the positive side about what it is, including the synopsis of what it is. So, uh, uh, sort of, uh, uh, in fact, uh, uh, for one, uh, I did not prepare a PowerPoint presentation because sometimes PowerPoint presentation makes it a little narrow in terms of the coverage that one is expected to do. Uh, so I thought, let it flow and uh, uh, rightly so. So uh, now I have to actually uh, uh, place my propositions uh, between these two and I will try to do it. Uh, and I will try to do slightly differently because uh, majority of the participants are from the academia. Maybe I will resort to a little bit of storytelling and the storytelling will be based on real life instances. Uh, 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 Professor Sunil Mani has been very generous in trying to tell what all I have done, uh, but there were many things that I couldn't do, and uh, maybe that is one of the reasons why I thought I'll refer it to anecdotal type of storytelling type of thing. So the next 10 minutes, uh, uh, pardon me, at least one good thing that will happen is that uh, I won't bore you with the technological terms, but I will try to make it as practical as possible. So that is one. Uh, let me uh, uh, stop this general bore and I will go off on uh, what I wanted to say. Uh, before we talk about digital banks, uh, uh, let me narrate another incident. Uh, uh, and this was possibly somewhere in the early, uh, I wouldn't say early, in the mid 90s, uh, 95, 96, when one of the things that the Reserve Bank was trying to do was to have uh, a deepening of the financial inclusion. Uh, and many of our, us uh, had uh, responsibilities of different geographies where we tried to undertake uh, uh, studies as to which will be the best methodology for uh, more financial inclusion, how we take care of it. And mind you, these were the days in 1995, the uh, uh, mobile phones uh, had just come. Uh, and an inward call, uh, if I remember right, used to cost six rupees. And uh, if Patare just calls me uh, and, and I happen to be the wrong number, just to say wrong number, I have to pay six rupees for a call which I don't benefit. But that was one. And the second is telecommunications, as we know today, was not what it was those days. Um, one couldn't depend on uh, the communication structure that was there. 
the Reserve Bank had actually, after the liberalization in 1991, had insisted that banks should be fully technology-based. Uh, what Mr. Nar Ramchandran said earlier was that all banks today uh, have the entire technology base. But if one were to go back uh, two decades ago, uh, uh, and since uh, most of us are from a state where uh, labor rights are uh, uh, one of the most important things that we actually take pride in ourselves. Uh, in fact, it was a tough job for me to even introduce computers in banks. And, uh, 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 well, I don't want to go back on history, but it was a tough game because people used to think that computers means less jobs. Uh, and I used to tell my trade union friends, uh, although I used to support trade unionism, my view was that you shall not prevent citizens from growing by restrictive practices. And in fact, one of the things I said is this community called stenographers who used to actually take dictation and then use typing. Uh, in fact, uh, I don't take any credit, but then I was telling that that community will possibly pay away, pale away into oblivion. And that's what has happened today. Most of us are actually glorified stenographers, whether we are doing a WhatsApp message, whether we sit in office and prepare a paper, a, a note, or we are in an academic institution and prepare a paper, we do our own typing, we do our own cutting and pasting and using all the tools. So whatever that group used to do has gone on. What was the need for this? The need was technology. Uh, Mr. Ramchandran made a very pertinent point on what did the Amazon do or what did most of these uh, breakthrough startups, what are they doing today? Uh, those of you who have had exposure to management, uh, in fact, one of the fundamental things which they teach in management institutes, uh, I'm sure that is done even in economics, uh, is that what is the difference between a want and a need? Uh, a need is something which is basic, it is essential, it has to be provided for. A want is something which is desirable and that is where people actually try to ma market uh, for want so that people are actually able to get what they want. At the end of it, the businesses are able to provide or sell what they want. So ultimately the word want is what is there. So when Swiggy or Zomato, if they have a huge business today, it was because of the growing change. I remember in the childhood, uh, Going to a hotel and eating was possibly a, a great outing occasion happening once in three months or perhaps once in a year. Uh, and as kids, we used to look forward to that. Uh, and many times than not, uh, it ended up in not getting what we really wanted. Today, uh, the things have changed. The economy has changed. The preferences has changed. And people want food whenever they want, wherever they want, and whatever time they want. This is where the Zwiggy and Zomato, Zomatos have actually come in. So there was a felt want, a felt want arising out of a felt need because hunger is a basic need. The means to support it is by saying, I want food, let's say when I'm traveling in the train. So if the train is, uh, uh, let's say, going from uh, Tirunantapuram to uh, Arunakulam, uh, I want, let's say, food that Maveli Kera, I will be getting it there delivered by Zomato or Swiggy. Earlier on, it never used to be there. All I used to be uh, have to be content with is whatever the railways were offering in the railway station or in the pantry car, if at all there was one on Vaynard Express or something like that. So the point which I wanted to say is that whenever there is a felt need converted into a felt want, there is a huge potential, which is what I think Mr. Ramchandran was trying to hint when he said, what was the customer acquisition cost? Before even going to customer acquisition cost, is the customer happy? Uh, so I will go back to my anecdotal uh, thing, which I started off when in 1995, we went actually, I was much more younger those days. I still think I am young anyway. Uh, so when we went to a village uh, in the Northeast, uh, 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 I had the job of actually trying to do a survey uh, in a remote village, uh, which took almost 20 hours to even reach uh, from the nearest uh, capital city. But then uh, when I was going on, uh, uh, there was this old lady and I was trying to tell the old lady, look, ma, you can do some type of operations using, and these were just feature phones those days, that you can try to do something. And I was trying to explain to her in Hindi, I said, sakte hai, sakta sakta hai, and all. She heard me for more than a minute patiently. And then finally she said, Beta mere paas isse better phone hai. In other words, she said that she's got a phone which was better than what I was holding. Why did she have it? Because her son, who was actually employed in the Gulf, she, he wanted to talk to her frequently. He wanted to ensure that she got money periodically. So he bought a phone from there, gave it to her. She was, in our words, illiterate, but she knew how to dial. She knew how to see SMS, although she never knew English. 
those days only english was available she knew how to see and she knew he used to make uh, uh, comprehensive understandable outcomes about the messages uh, i even wonder always we used to say we are an illiterate or we used to be an illiterate economy go to any city in, in india if you use the term bus people will understand the numbers in buses mostly are not in the devanagari strip they are in the roman numerals and and they were along with the roman numerals you will also have a b c d so it will be 19 a 19 b etc everybody understands that even the word bus if you use the technical malayalam word for bus i think even if you go to a deep village in uh, uh, kerala maybe some some people may not understand that it's the same across all the languages so what is the felt need that we are trying to address why i gave this example is that if a person has a need they will certainly adopt it this old lady in the northeast she had a need she didn't know how to operate a phone before her son gave a phone but she knew how to operate it much better than perhaps what i used to know those days of the mobile phone infancy anyway fast forward now here so my view on this is as follows if there is a felt need certainly it will be taken care of if there is no felt need it will take off but one doesn't know whether the journey will result in the rocket going to the moon or whether from sri hari kota it comes back uh, to the bay of bengal so the point and this is where the fintech and this is a, a, a great uh, opportunity for the fintechs uh, today india is actually reveling in the benefits out of innovation coming from the fintech uh, entities uh, uh, there was a mention about the upi and the national payments corporation of india uh, it's actually gratifying to see some of those initiatives which we did when we were back when i was back in the rbi today we can actually uh, uh, say with a little amount of pride that india has perhaps the best retail payment systems in the world there are many other countries including the us who are trying to now come and say that we would like to learn how you are doing your system so that we can replicate it there why did this happen this happened because people needed to send money across so if you have students studying in cds and their parents are elsewhere i'm sure that the student will need to pay hostel money uh, maybe rent periodically or pay for the uh, food that he has to do or for other expenses which may be required money is something which is required and if money can take a long time in coming its objective is actually defeated and therefore systems which have been institutions which have been successful and systems which have been successful are all what actually met a felt need so what is this felt need in digital banking the fintechs will say yes i can provide a digital bank great a bank which is set to be to be set up will say i will start up as a, not as a brick and mortar branch but as a technology oriented digital bank that will be great uh, i don't think the reserve bank will have any great concern except that they may bring in certain prudential requirements as to how a financial uh, entity which functions only on a digital platform should function because uh i'm sure all of us are aware about the pitfalls about uh, uh, the digital uh, eco space uh, where just like digital provides facilitation digital also begets uh, some of the nefarious type of things which are there i won't go into it that we can talk about cyber security and other things later on but the point is what is this felt need in a country like india where labor is not a big concern is digital going to be the final call now let me again give one more story and then i will round up this story is uh, something which i always uh, uh, like to mention in some of the classes that i handle uh the indian ethos or the indian psyche this is fairly different from some of the rest of the uh, other countries in the world and those of you who have done psychology will understand this very clearly uh if you go to a museum uh, 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 in fact i always uh, admire uh, museum in tiruvannathapuram If you go to a museum, you will find a lot of exhibits. There is a board there which says, "Please do not touch." And what is the first thing that, as Indians, we do? Touch. Okay. You go to a place wherever it says, "Don't do." Uh, I used to wonder in the railway stations as a kid. I used to find a board which says, "Spit here." I used to wonder why should there be a board saying "Spit here"? And you will find that, except in that bucket there, all other places there is tobacco and other stains, which means people spit where they should not. so this rebellious this is the indian ethos or the psycho where if you are forced to do something you wouldn't do but if you are allowed to do something on your own you will certainly do that so what is it that we like to do take the case of the brick and mortar banks in most of the villages and most of the rural pockets and in even lot of cities and towns the bank manager is actually a friend a philosopher and guide 
the people actually go and discuss with him uh, of course today the younger generation doesn't do it but at least the earlier generation used to do it so if there was some financial planning that has to be done somebody in the bank where was actually used to be spoken to well if the person in the bank was not available there would there was always a relative in the family who had some relationship with a financial institution who used to talk to him so one of the things we always pride in is the discussion the capability to talk i will juxtapose this with another thing uh, uh again uh, this is not a, 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 an offline session otherwise i would have uh, loved to do it uh many of us suppose we we are all people who like uh, film actors if we meet a film actor what is the first thing that we would like to do the response i normally get is i would like to take it an autograph i would like to shake hands uh if if one were to be very honest we would like to touch the actor uh, let's say he is amitabh bachchan uh, we would like to touch him and see whether he is he is really a person like me he is but the basic thing is that it is slightly different so in india we like the touch and feel that is why currency is still or cash is still king we like to talk to people we are a talkative society the argumentative indian the book which was written by a nobel laureate so taking all this into account i am not too sure whether a no talk no presence type of digital bank will really work it will work for a for a particular activity meaning payment systems payments digitally work because we don't we don't want to see how the payments work all of us know to drive a vehicle but we don't need to know necessarily how the engine works all we need to know is how to press the accelerator the brake and the gears and hey we go so that is what is there so given all this one has to be doubly cautious about a completely digital environment not from a regulatory space not from a government facilitation space but from what the customer wants how many of us will be very comfortable in putting money in an institution which we have never seen in fact if you see most of the physical banks in india their head offices or their uh, uh, big big uh, controlling offices will actually be towering buildings which gives the feeling that we are here to protect the same thing happens for insurance the same thing happens for most of the financial institutions it gives a signal that we are here to protect we are here to take care of your money we are here to ensure that you get the money when you want that may not necessarily be coming out of the uh, digital scenario i will also talk a little bit about today's youngsters today's youngsters may like to do a lot of transactions digitally there's no doubt about that but then when it comes to actually depositing their money they would like to see the proof of the deposit it could be a digital proof but they would like to see the proof as to how the money is kept how is it invested how is it going to give me the returns etc something which can be also seen it is something like politics can we think about having a virtual politician i don't think the world is ready artificial intelligence may bring in new types of requirements it might try to come and say ganesh kumar you need uh, now 25000 rupees in the next 3 days here is a bank which is ready to give 25000 rupees here is the best interest rate this is how you have to repay ai may and business and uh, big data analytics may try to give all that but then does ganesh kumar require the money for the purpose that is required possibly his wife will tell his son will tell or his father will tell who is that consolidation consultant who is going to do it in the case of a digital bank it could be a chatbot it could be something which is technology oh driven but i'm not too sure whether that will re really meet the requirements so my view on this is that as an experiment it's good as a long term thing one has to wait and see uh, so for the time being i would only try to say it's a good point to start off whether it is going to have a long dur duration one has to wait and see uh, i'll stop my bore with this and then maybe we can have some few questions if there is time thanks for the patient here uh, thank you very much mr ganesh kumar for uh, first raising this point about felt need for digital banks and then also at, at the same time being very cautious about uh, uh, you know uh, dig digital banks now we have the third, last speaker uh, who is actually a distinguished alumni of the center professor suresh babu who is currently professor of economics at the Indian Institute of Management, uh, Madras, Chennai. Uh, Suresh Babu has done his PhD from CDS. Then he has worked at the Gokhale Institute of Politics and Economics at uh, Institute for Social and Economic Change in Bangalore and also in CDS. He has been a visiting professor at two universities abroad, one at the University of uh, Wurzburg uh, in Germany and at the University of Los Lausanne in uh, Switzerland. Uh, he has been a member of uh, the Rangarajan Committee, which was set up by the government uh, of Tamil Nadu. 
to advise the government. And also he has been a consultant to World Bank, ADP, DFIT, and Government of India. Okay, he has written three books and a whole host of uh, uh, papers in uh, refereed journals. And he also write popular articles in newspapers. And recently he has written about uh, the, the, the rise of uh, startups in the FinTech area. And so I think he will have also have something interesting to say about digital banks. So uh, Suresh, uh, a very warm welcome back to your uh, uh, alma mater. And uh, let's see what you have to say. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sunil, for this generous introduction. And it's always a pleasure and privilege to be back in CDS. Uh, what I shall do is uh, let's not speak about whether we need digital banks or not. But we have already uh, heard about that. Let's so just focus on the document which has been put out for discussion by the Niti IO. And I shall uh, perhaps uh, highlight some of the things that could have been a part of the document. And perhaps at times I might be a little harsh, but then uh, I think the idea of putting out this document in public is to uh, uh, garner comments and improve the document. So it is in that uh, light that I would be commenting on the document. Okay, so let me just put up my slides. Give me a minute. Uh, I hope my, my, my slide is visible. Yes, visible. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Sir. Okay, so, uh, so let me just run through the document quickly. I know I'm, I'm taking a risk of being very repetitive here. Professor Parsa Ray has already gone through the document, uh, and uh, Professor Nar and uh, uh, Mr. Narayan has already commented about some of the uh, things that are missing in the document. Let me just bring back the focus on to the document that is put out in terms of, of today's discussion. Now, let me start with the scope. I'm just, you know, uh, uh, paraphrasing what is there in the document. We heard this. This paper, that is a paper by Niti Aayog, which banks as defined by the PR Act of 1949, Entities that will issue deposits, make loans, and offer full suite of services that the DR Act empowers to do. Having said, said that, we will see when we go further that the first stage we are delimiting the scope of this digital bank. I'll come to that in a minute. Well, uh, it's also very, very important to note that DBs will principally rely on internet and other approximate channels offer their services and not physical branches. And that's a point which I want to really pick up uh, uh, towards the end of my presentation, because that's where I think uh, we need to really discuss and deliberate. Uh, but very importantly, um, the full sense bank, and it will be subject to prudential and liquidity norms at par with the incumbent commercial bank. So there is no relaxation on that front. The idea this document puts out is that creating a new licensing or a regulatory framework is being proposed as regulatory innovation and not regulatory arbitrage. And that's a point which I want to come back when I conclude. Okay. So what is the rationale? The rationale is very, very clearly stated in the document. This, there is a prevalent model in India now. And that prevalent model is the new bank business model. And this new bank business model is a function of what Nidhi Ayo calls as regulatory vacuum. Why? Because there is an absence of a, of a licensing regime for full stack digital banks. Okay. In this absence, fintechs are offering this new bank proposition in India have improvised and adopted the front end new bank model. We'll see that as we as we continue our discussions. As the name indicates, this is a partnership between traditional banks and neo banks such that the later bring in engagement layer and the former 
bring in the utility layer and both sides of the balance of their balance sheet. So this is, this is what is prevailing now. I want to move ahead and bring in a full stack into a digital bank license now. And why do we need that? According to the document, this present model, that is the new bank model, uh, presents several challenges, including with respect to revenue and viability. And there have been three challenges which have been highlighted in the document, of course, very, very important. Limited revenue potential with this model. Uh, there is a possibility of uh, obsolescence of the partner bank's core banking system. We, 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 we heard a lot about that, how it evolved over a period of time. And then there are new technologies that are coming in. So there is always a conflict between these two that is that is really going to be a problem. And then, of course, uh, high cost of capital, no entry barrier. And this no entry barrier is something which which I would like to highlight uh, when I when I stop my presentation. So what is the proposal? The document is a very, very crisp and a very neat short document, I would say. Yeah. That is that is also one of the drawbacks of the document. Uh, it maps out global regulatory responses for digital banks by constructing what uh, I find a little surprising, the digital global bank regulatory index, and there's no, no index. Basically, it's a scorecard that has been put out in terms of four factors. So when I when, when I looked at this you know document, I was searching for this index and then trying to see what are the weights for this index in typically an economist's mind, whether they have used uh, principal component analysis correctly and things of that sort. Nothing of that sort. It's a scorecard on four indicators: entry barriers, competition, business restrictions, and technological neutrality. You could debate about these these four. Uh, Kind of dimensions yeah of course there are a lot of overlaps entry barriers and competition there is definitely overlap and perhaps i would say uh, a little more emphasis on technological neutrality should have been given these are debatable issues Many things emerge from this exercise that is uh, there are issues which are running themes which needs closer discussions one of course technological neutrality which the document after that point conveniently avoids which I would say is very important to calibration and three an exit plan. None of which is taken up very, very uh, currently in the later part of the document. And I'll say why it is not taken up. So uh, then there is a there is a sequence and a template as to how to go about in this whole process of licensing and all this. That is the sequencing as well as this template that is suggested is informed by this so called Digital bank regulatory index that was created. And what is the what is the final output? Well, there is a template that is a regulatory framework template that is provided. Yeah. What, what is recommended is a two stage approach, and I want to draw your attention here. Quote: It is recommended that a digital business bank license be phased in stage one. So please remember, digital business bank. Yeah, not not a not a kind of a bank which you know, uh, you and me might bank with. Yeah. And the rationale for digital uh, business bank is that they have already uh, discussed the credit flows to MSME sector and there is a gap which had to be uh, bridged. And that is why this digital business bank is being noted. And the RBI may consider uh, introducing a digital universal bank later on in stage two. Yeah after gathering the experience in stage one yeah and then a sequence is provided introduce this you know restricted digital business business bank license then uh, enlist it in the regulatory sandbox which was explained by Prasad Partha Ray earlier and then look at the performance contingent on sat satisfactory performance of the licensee uh, the initial set of restrictions will be relaxed and then a full stack digital uh, business bank would come out of it and that is the thing well uh, the conditions well as as like any other you know banking license conditions these are the these are the conditions that have been put up minimum paid up capital etc etc and here also i want to highlight that there is technological uh, neutrality which has been put out but we don't find much of a discussion here now let me come to my comments on this document having summarized this document I have four comments to offer and I'll be very brief on that. My first comment is that, well, uh, 
the document actually addresses a very, very small component of the overall fintech ecosystem that we are talking about. Yeah, and I would say that a document from the Niti Aayog, which which is being put out in public domain for discussions, would or should be rather more comprehensive in terms of its approach. And such a comprehensive approach approach is required to tackle issues in the fintech ecosystem. Why I say this is that, as 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 you see in my slide, the fintech verticals are many, and fintech horizontals are plenty. And digital banking is just one of the small areas in which they are going to have this licensing norm. You can't see it in isolation because it is intertwined with a lot of other entities in this entire ecosystem. Yeah. So my point number one is that the scope as well as the kind of, of a mechanism that is proposed looks like a very, very small fraction of the larger ecosystem that we would like to see in place as well as regulate in the future. Why do I say this again? Well, uh, the Reserve Bank of India on on uh, to be precise on November 18, 2021 bought out, brought out a document in terms of the report of the working group on digital lending. Yeah, and I'll come to that in a minute. And that is a very comprehensive document as as always, whatever the Reserve Bank does is, does is much more comprehensive than some of the other entities in the country. In that we see that, well, the complexity of this entire place that we are trying to regulate is clearly mapped out. And I, I don't want to go to the paragraphs of, of uh, this whole you know, document, but just want to uh, bring your attention to this marketplace lenders, NBFCs and P2Ps, which is a small fraction of this entire ecosystem that we are talking about. Now, why do I say this? I say this because, well, there is a need to understand the big picture that we are trying to regulate. Why? Well, regulation initiatives will influence the type of competition between incumbents as well as new entrants. And when I say incumbents, well, banking, there are already incumbents, there are fintechs, and there are new entrants, there are you know potential disruptors, right? The dynamics of that competition will be completely changed when the regulation initiatives come in place. So we need to see this entire thing in a larger picture rather than looking at a very small component of it. And that is what perhaps the paper misses out. Now, this is actually, you know, modeled very beautifully in some of the game theoretic models by uh, Xavier Wives and his team. And we find that uh, if or some of the results of such models show that if regulation manages to ensure a level playing field, then the likelihood of head to head competition potentially rises and that we know that's a result which is very well known. But in contrast, if policies imply asymmetric regulations between fintech and big tech, yeah, again, very important on one hand and traditional banks on the other hand, yeah, that could actually encourage entry, encourage entry from a lot of fintechs and big techs. Of course, that would augment contestability in the market also. Yeah, why? Because there could be lower switching cost and that could enhance market transparency. All that is fine. But some of these results show that. Well, this increase in competition, it will only be a short term competition and this will have to be balanced given the potential long term risk of monopolization by the big tech firms. And that's a worry which I want to share with you and I'll come to that in a minute and that. Monopolization could also be by certain platform transformed incumbents also. So there is a possibility that this opening up yeah, might actually infuse some, some degree of competition initially, but over time, the stability of that competition, as well as the possibility of the rise of monopolies is something which we need to watch out for, and that perhaps the document is completely silent. on. Let me come to RBI's document. Well, as I said, it's a very exhaust, exhaustive document, and and I was just just looking in the media whether there have been any uh, discussions on that, and I did not find. Except for today's mint, today's mint has carried out some some of the uh, highlights of this. Well, look at loans that are distributed through uh, digital channels over time. Yeah, 17, 18, 19, and 20. Yeah, 
and we find 2020 up to December uh, 20 also, yeah, financial year as well as up to the calendar year. We find that both NBFCs as well as scheduled commercial banks, digital lending has increased tremendously. Okay. And again, I come back to this point that this is why we should understand this larger ecosystem and we should contextualize this whole licensing and regulatory framework in this larger ecosystem. Let me put out one more set of data. Well, look at the share of different lenders through digital channels. And here I want to draw your attention to this change that is taking place. Well, NBFCs, yeah, this LO, which are only 6.3 percentage in uh, 2017, by 20, it is increased to 30 percentage. They are emerging as big players. Yeah. And increasingly, we also find that public sector banks are also becoming major players in this. So what I really want to emphasize is that this whole landscape of digital lending is actually changing. And if you are thinking of a regulatory mechanism, we should actually take into consider this whole changing dynamics of this whole landscape. OK, let me come to RBI's document and just, you know, uh, summarize what they have to say, because these two documents have to be read in terms of, you know, in tandem to get a, a holistic picture of what we are discussing today. Well, uh, RBI says that this whole rise of digital banks or what is now called as neo banks should be covered under the reserve banks regulation. So Niti Aayog should not be the one to really uh, give us advices. We should be controlling. It's quite clear there. Well, uh, there is also a very, very important statement in RBI's document that as multiple players have access to sensitive consumer and financial data, there must be clarity on the issue of the type of data that can be held, the length of the time data can be held, restrictions on the use of the data and data destruction protocols, which the NTIO document is completely silent of. Well, I'm not I'm not going further into this, but I want, want to have one more point which which has come up in our discussions. Yeah, digital lending agencies should provide mandatory user education. Yeah, and that's very important. A point which uh, Professor Parthari as well as Mr. Ganesh Kumar was highlighting. Yeah, so I think RBI's document has to be seen in a much more comprehensive way, and that has to be read in conjuncture with the Niti Aayog's document. My third comment. Well, uh, when I look through the document, the challenge of regulation, which the uh, document actually puts out in a very simplistic manner, is actually much more than what is assumed in the document. Why I say this? Well, we have plenty of literature on this whole, you know, uh, idea of an optimal regulatory mechanism for banks. And if we focus on that optimal regulatory mechanism, we fall prey to this very naive view that powerful regulators are important and they work in the best of the interest of the society and all regulated banks will submissively abide by these powerful regulators. But that's not the reality. Well, regulation has to be seen in terms of a game where each agent is developing its own strategy given its own objectives. And that's why perhaps this, this document, I would say, is quite, you know, uh, naive in terms of or putting out the complexities of regulation is just bypassed in this document. Now, um, why do I say this? I say this because there are two possibilities in literature which actually come up when we look at this whole regulatory apparatus. One, there is regulatory dialectics and then there is regulatory captive models. Yeah, And these have been discussed well in the literature. In fact, you know, uh, Krosner's and Raghuram Rajan's work is one of the interesting pieces that that talks about this possibility of, you know, uh, the political economy of regulatory motivation. So. This whole regulatory mechanism, which is proposed then should be clear of how many regulators will be there to implement the policy that is chosen. Yeah, is RBA the only regulator? Well, we need to be clear about that. Okay. Now, there is also the possibility that if you allow only one regulator, for example, RBI, then the overall regulatory problem yeah, would actually be tackled from only one dimension. For example, RBI's prime focus would be financial stability, but there could be other social you know, objectives which have to be brought under the ambit of regulation. 
So we need to be clear in terms of what kind of a regulatory architecture are we really suggesting here? Okay. Final thing about this regulatory uh, uh, architecture is that this regulatory framework will definitely change the incentives and strategies of the regulated sector. There is no doubt about that. And that's why that's why I say it's a game, basically. There will always be feedback and the regulator must anticipate such feedbacks and they should factor in such feedbacks into the regulatory design. So, so a very simplistic model that has been put out in public domain, then it's a lot of reworking and rethinking to really get into the complexities of this issue. Right? Suresh, yeah. uh, could you uh, summarize? Yeah, yeah, I'm just the final point. Both comment is that there's a big role for big techs in this whole, whole uh, ecosystem. And the document is completely silent about that. And why I say this? Just one piece of data, and then I'll wind up. For example, if you look at the market share of leading firms in cloud infrastructure, yeah, well, Amazon Web Service, Microsoft Azure, Google Cloud, and IBM Cloud, they dominate this. So when we are talking about digital platforms, well, we also need to understand that there is also this whole, you know, big techs. You know, presence there, which we need to take into account. Finally, well, I would I would conclude by saying that it's a very first kind of a document, which should have been a little more exhaustive. The focus of the document is more on licensing than on regulation. Well, and I would say it should have had a very very good discussion on the goal of regulation, which has not been clearly spelled out. And I would say that the three pillars have to be reinforced here. That is customer protection two financial system integrity, which is very important, and three, market integrity, which is an important aspect. And I will leave you with this quote from the, from the document that, well, there is a need to regulate because it could create a herd mentality in terms of simply replicating business models and products already witnessed by the markets rather than genuine innovation. In other words, there is a me too risk, and that's what Niti Aayog talks about the need for regulation. So I'll stop here and if there are discussion points, we'll thank you so much. Thank, thank you, Suresh, for a, such a comprehensive uh, evaluation of the uh, document. Uh, now, I think the floor is open. We just have only 10 minutes more to discuss. Uh, the, I can see there is one question in the chat box uh, by uh, from Mr. Krishna Kumar uh, to Professor Partha Ray. So, should I read it out or Partha, have you? No, uh, you have to unmute yourself. Partha. Yeah, I'm able to read it. Yeah. My response is yes, that's what I hinted. And that's perfectly comes out from Professor Suresh Babu's presentation. But okay. Yes, I, I think that certain kind of unregulated sector here at some point of time may lead to a crisis. And that's how you feel. I mean, we have already experienced it. Digital lending, for example. We have, for example, experienced in case of digital lending, there are a number of, you know, uh, I will use the forceful word called scams, but at least irregularities definitely. Already you have experienced that in case of digital lending. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, so Marni, can I ask the... Yes, please, please, please go on. Uh, yeah, but I was really happy and uh, happy with the specific details which Professor Babu was uh, uh, bringing out in the course of his presentation. The sort of contrast which he was drawing between the documents of the Nithi Ayoga and the RBI. And... Particularly, so my specific query is this: that Professor Babu was rightly drawing attention towards this asymmetries with respect to regulation, with respect to big tech and fintech. But the main animal in the house, main and main body, that is the main financial system, that is if you basically take the commercial banking regulatory cost, if the regulatory cost of the commercial banks is tilted high. They are put to pressure. Worldwide, we find that the banking role, that is the assets under the control of the banks, when it's on the when it's on the reduction, when it's on the when it's on the fall, 
we find that the assets under the control of different other NBFCs as well as hedge funds and all these sorts of funds are on the rise. And within our country, like how Professor Babu himself has mentioned, the presence of this growing NBFCs, which also is because of the regulatory overreach. So I thought uh, Professor Babu could or Krishna Kumar, uh, we are not able to hear you properly. You are, yes. uh, your voice is getting interrupted. I did return it down. I think, Professor Bab Dr. Babu, you would have got what I have meant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks, uh, Krishna Kumar. Yeah, no, so I think uh, this whole uh, game is a different game in terms of regulating the big techs and the fintechs. And it is here that, you know, uh, when I was trying to see it from a very conventional industrial organization perspective, that's when we started to realize that the game has changed completely. Yeah, because regulation from an industrial organization perspective is perhaps pretty straightforward when we look at, you know, big techs as well as fintechs. And that that change is precisely because of these asymmetries that come out of such uh, regulatory tools that we conventionally use. And that perhaps is one of the biggest challenges of public policy now. In terms of uh, when I was talking about uh, how many regulators, for example, yeah, there should be definitely RBI. But as as technology is an important component of of this whole you know uh, process, should we at all have uh, more regulators in this? When there are more regulators, then of course then we might need a super regulator on top of these major regulators. So I think uh, it's a slightly uh, complicated issue where we are still uh, trying to evolve a model there. And NBFCs, perhaps I will leave to my other panelists, uh, uh, Professor Krishna Kumar. Yeah. Thanks. Yes. Uh, what about Narayan and, and Ganesh Kumar? Uh, would you like to respond to? And the specific question related to NBFCs is what? The rising Kumar? share of the rising share of NBFCs in the in the post GFC period, we find that the share of the NBFCs has risen substantially. Is this also a method by means, and they are also seeking large funds from through the issuance of international debt securities abroad. So you can have funds being mobilized both from the international market, denominating in dollars and creating rupee assets, and you can have also also loans. Which you, you need not actually make efforts towards bearing the cost of maintenance of the deposit accounts. You can have large accounts, large deposits, large liabilities like that and create assets. And this is so also I, a method. So yeah, I, 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 got, I get the question. So thank you, uh, Mr. Kumar. Uh, so the, the rise of NBFCs is also due to multiple factors. First, banks have become lazy and air conditioned. Uh, that's the principal reason. So they're essentially NBFC is a distribution channel, exactly like you're thinking of digital as a distribution channel, NBFC distribution channel. If you look on the loan side of banks, the maximum loan of any bank in the country is to NBFCs. So in a way, the banking system supports the banking system, if you want to think of it that way, right? So that's number one. Number two, actually innovation is taking place in NBFCs because actually return on assets, even though risk of a, risk is higher, return on assets in NBFCs can be much higher than return on assets in banking systems because of all the costs you mentioned, including the most important cost, which is the priority sector cost. Now, some people will think of that as a cost. Some, some people will think of that as a benefit, but such as it is from the point of view of a single bank, it is a cost. So if you take the best bank in the country, it's probably operating at a return on asset of less than 2%, whereas the best NBFCs in the country operate at five or 6% return on assets. So it is much more profitable to be, in fact, the biggest debate in the conversion of NBFCs into small finance banks in all the boards, and I sat on two or three of them at that time, was why should we give up a 6% business for a 2% business? Uh, and and it, many comp many did not do it. So Mahindra Finance, for instance, did not take that approach. Uh, Sundaram Finance did not take that approach and so on for, for that reason. So profitability at higher risk is higher for NBFCs. But it has become a much more innovative distribution channel for the existing banking system. Uh, that's the way I would characterize it. I don't know whether Mr. Ganesh Kumar, you want to add anything. 
Uh, uh, right. Uh, uh, I, I quite agree. In fact, uh, uh, the NDFCs have uh, become more like a distribution channel for the banking system. But only one, two small points that I wanted to uh, add to that. One is the reach of these NDFCs is mostly towards the retail sector and to perhaps to a small extent to, to the SMEs. That also is not fully achieved. Uh, that's one. Whereas there is a potential that if there is a digital mode, maybe it can go in a more targeted manner. Uh, uh, I don't know whether uh, some of you are aware, there is already a system which the Reserve Bank has actually uh, fostered. Uh, uh, you made a point that Reserve Bank is actually uh, being too uh, narrow, which is called the TREDS, which is the Trade Receivables and Discounting System. This is specifically for the MSMEs for bridging the gap between governments paying the bills of the small scale industries and the middle medium scales who supply to the government and they get the bills paid after a long gap of time. So the financiers come in between and against the delivers, deliverables which have been made, they do finances. So digital has that advantage. So the NBFCs are doing something similar to that. And in fact, uh, uh, maybe at a later point in time, we can discuss uh, separately uh, the role of the, the cooperative banks, the urban cooperative banks, the regional role. They, each of them actually takes care of a niche segment. The public sector banks in general have not actually reached out to that level. So to that extent, a digital bank may perhaps take care of a particular niche segment. But as rightly uh, what uh, Professor Suresh Babu said is actually very right. Uh, it's like trying to take care of only the skim in the milk. Uh, you take the cream out and think that the entire milk is going to be taken care of once the cream is taken. The rest of the milk below is not as thick as the cream which has come out. And that requires, if you're going to make coffee or tea out of it, you need to actually embellish it to make it thicker. So, which is, I'm sorry, I made an, an, an example which may not be exactly right, but then that is what is required. And at the end of all this, just to answer Krishna Kumar's point, uh, one of the most important things that is required in an Indian context is the trust for the depositors. Most of us are now talking about the creditors, the people who are taking the loans, which is okay. But where do you get the money from? This about getting external commercial borrowings is a temporary phenomenon. I don't think that can be sustained over a long period of time. Today, because interest rates are favorable, people are taking loans from abroad. That as business cycles change, it will change. So ultimately, if people have to, dep the depositors have to put money in these institutions, including digital banks, how do they get the trust? Uh, 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 Suresh Babu's point was very right. There are a big ad advantages brought in by the regulation saying that my money is safe notwithstanding failures the rate of failure in india is perhaps the best in the world i'm not saying this just because i wasn't a regulator there are a lot of loopholes that are uh, aspects which we have to improve so krishna kumar's point there is regulatory costs are there there's no doubt about that but then it is better to have regulatory costs rather than the money going away. Uh, we know of whatever used to happen in chit funds, blade companies, Kerala used to have it. So the point is one needs to balance all this. And that is another thing which has to be taken into account in the case of the digital banks as well. I'll stop here. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Ganesh Kumar. I think we have almost come to the end of the uh, time as far as time is concerned, but just in case if someone wants to ask one question, uh, we do have the time for that. Anyone from the floor? Okay, I I, I think it looks uh, it it looks like uh, uh, there are no further questions. Uh, um, I think that is a very comprehensive uh, discussion. You know, all four of you brought different aspects of uh, uh, the discussion paper into. That on to the table. Uh, I think uh, now it's for students and others to go through the the document carefully and then uh, uh, and and study it more carefully and uh, form their opinion. Okay, so I take this opportunity to thank all the four distinguished panelists. I thank uh, Professor Parthar Ray. I thank uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Narayan Ramchandran and Mr. Ganesh Kumar and Professor Suresh Babu. And uh, it's been really wonderful because uh, I myself learned a lot from your presentations. And uh, uh, we look forward to having you here at the center later on when in-person activities resumed. <laughs> and uh, uh, so uh, in the meantime, I wish you the very best for the new year because we may not be seeing you before that. Okay, so all the best and thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure.